Good morning, everybody. Bonjour. Uh, my name is Jay Pipes. I work at Marantis, and uh, this is Peter Boros. He works at Percona. Today we're going to be talking about MySQL um, in its relation to OpenStack, what works, what doesn't really work very well, and uh, we're going to be showing you some analysis of the MySQL query load that is generated um, by the various OpenStack services during um, some runs of the Rally benchmarking program. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about our, our setup. We used uh, an Amazon Web Services virtual private cloud uh, for a whole bunch of nodes to do the testing. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, our initial setup and then what we actually ended up using um, uh, based on some problems we ran into with the first setup. And then we're going to talk about how we analyze the, the MySQL query loads that were generated from the Rally tool. And uh, we're going to show you uh, output of Rally and uh, PT Query Digest. Uh, with, and uh, Peter's going to talk to you a little bit about how Galera cluster works um, uh, compared to a standard MySQL master, master server or master slave ser service setup. Um, so, what did, what did we plan on doing <laughs> for this talk? So, we, we really did want to uh, isolate the interactions between the various OpenStack components, Nova, Neutron, Cinder, all that kind of stuff, and uh, the back end database server, right? We were not interested in you know, whether Zen is faster than uh, KVM or, or any of the stuff that goes on at the vert layer. Um, we are strictly trying to uh, examine the database communication between various nodes within the OpenStack services uh, layer and the database. And we're trying to identify the types of bottlenecks on the database side of things that, that occur uh, under uh, realistic workloads. Um, now, there's a, a little bit of a, a trade-off there. It's because we're using the fake vert driver in Nova, uh, so you know it's not actually creating a VM and plugging in networking and all that kind of stuff, um, we're able to execute a, a rally boot and, and delete scenario or of tens of thousands of VMs. Uh, of course, that doesn't represent a real uh, real world timing because obviously those VMs are going to be created very quickly in comparison, but it does allow us to isolate um, on the database layer and take a look at the types of queries that are generated um, from the Nova, Neutron, Cinder, uh, Glance services uh, for that type of payload. So um, we used uh, multiple Amazon Web Services instances installed with uh, OpenStack services. Uh, we used unmodified uh, IceHouse packages for this, unmodified uh, MySQL Percona packages for MySQL Galera cluster. A lot of what we talk about today, by the way, we'll, we'll talk about Galera cluster and Percona ExtraDB cluster, which is Percona's uh, uh, modified enhanced version of, of uh, uh, the upstream MySQL Galera cluster. But a lot of what we talk about is completely applicable to anyone who's running in uh, just a standard MySQL master-slave setup as well. Uh, the queries that are generated are the exact same, regardless of whether you're using a cluster database setup like uh, PXC or you're using MySQL master-slave. So of all the people here, how many people use standard MySQL master-slave replication? Okay, about 15, 20%. How many people use um, MySQL Galera cluster. Uh, how many people use a combination of both? Okay. Anyone use Postgres or another database, DB2 or? Okay. You have one person, Postgres. Okay. Sorry. Cool. Um, so yeah, we we tried as much as possible to stick with unmodified packages of everything um, because that's really what people are using. Um, and we used a set of Ansible playbooks. Anyone love Ansible like I do? Yay! Down with Chef. No, sorry. Um, <laughs> so we, uh, we had a lot of fun actually working together on this set of Ansible playbooks. Uh, and you can go to GitHub and, and uh, fork the, the code and investigate sort of how we set up Percona 
uh, extra DB cluster nodes with the bootstrap node and, and multiple uh, other Percona nodes and all the OpenStack services with the network node and all that kind of stuff if, if you're interested in that. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the things that we are interested in, like I said, are the database layer. Um, things that we didn't need to worry about, um, whether, for instance, uh, tenant VM to VM communication worked. Right? We're not interested in that because what we're, what we're doing is, is a fake vert driver and there's no, there's no actual VM that is created, right? Um, so we didn't have to worry about that. We didn't actually have to worry about actually starting a VM. Right, and waiting, uh, pulling for uh, libvirt kvm to, to actually start the VM instance. Um, so there's a lot of things that we didn't have to worry about. So we ran into um, some, some scaling bottlenecks sort of right away. Uh, one of those was the, uh, the controller. And, and <laughs> Peter's going to talk a little bit about uh, the first set of problems that we ran into when trying to actually put load on the database. So, at the first glance, we were, uh, we were using seven AWS uh, instances, one controller node, one compute, one network, uh, a separated out Galera cluster, uh, ExtraDB cluster, and one Raleigh benchmarking node. These were pretty beefy machines, uh, C3.8x large instances. And what we saw, so this is just you know writing the playbook based on the install guide, so installing OpenStack based on the install guide. And the database issues we discovered, this, this is actually not a title slide, so this is what we discovered based on this. So the database workload was so light, it was barely measurable. If I would give you a book with the data, you would be able to cope with the query workload manually, literally. So. We started uh, investigating what the bottleneck is, and the first that we ran into is the, uh, that by default Neutron server is, is a single thread, and that ate up a CPU core. So we set API workers and RPC workers. The next bottleneck we run into, this is actually different in Juno. In Juno you can have multiple uh, Keystone processes, but uh, Keystone in Icehouse is, a, if you are not running it in Apache, it's a single daemon. So it was again a, a single core bottleneck. While running uh, it in Apache, we ran into that bug. So that's the only modification we made, made to Keystone, so, so it works. We, and we also put the queue on a non-controller node. The network node's load was really low, so we figured that we, we could put the queue there. Uh, first, we actually put the queue on a separated node, but the network node needs to, uh, needs to be able to reach, so the DHCP agent of Neutron needs queue access, so it's, uh, it's good if it's, uh, if it's there. What we ended up having is one controller node. We want more in the future. We, we will see, you will see why. We created 10 uh, compute worker nodes, one network and queue node, three extra DB cluster nodes, and one node for Raleigh benchmarking. The computes were uh, not as beefy as, as the others, but the, the bottleneck, uh, bottleneck wasn't the... And the reason why we didn't need or want to, to use C3 8x large instances for the uh, compute nodes is that the Nova compute daemon is, is single process, <laughs> is single threaded. So um, putting it on 24 core uh, virtual machine makes absolutely no difference <laughs> whatsoever. Um, but having 10 of them as opposed to putting 10,000 instances on a single uh, compute node um, does uh, make an impact in the query generation. So the, uh, obviously, the, the, remember the, the objective here is to stress the database out. And we, we tried as much as possible to stress the database out. Um, so. yeah, one, uh, one other thing which we had to you know, configure, which is not usual in a production environment, that despite we were running with fake Nova driver, we, Nova still counted quotas. So we weren't able to start that many virtual machines. So we had to set the CPU and memory over commit rate to something like one million. So right, there's a there's a CPU allocation ratio and RAM allocation ratio settings in in NovaConf, and they control um, 
when you, when you schedule uh, an instance onto a Nova Compute Worker, uh, the way that it checks its resources and determines whether it has you know, capacity to, to run that VM uh, is, uh, it has its, its set of physical RAM and, 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 and cores, and then there's an, uh, an overcommit ratio called uh, allocation ratio. And we, can, we adjusted that by a factor of a million uh, <laughs> for each Nova Compute Worker, because obviously they're not actually using resources. Um, so we were able to do that to get around, um, you know, the issue with the scheduler would think that a compute node uh, was full when in fact it's, it's not at all. So. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, yeah, we enabled the first fake vert driver. We put 10 compute nodes um, to have a little bit more realistic um, setup so that it wasn't a single record in the compute nodes table, that we had more than one record in the compute nodes table, more than one record in the services table, which is, um, if you're familiar with uh, sort of how Nova works internally, there is a service group API that has actually a foreign key relationship to the compute nodes table. So for each compute worker that gets spun up, there is a record in the compute nodes table and then two records in the services table, one for the network uh, <coughs> topic and one for the uh, compute topic. And so um, there is a set of periodic interval tasks that run that update the, um, the scheduler's, uh, or rather the database's idea of the resources that are consumed on a compute instance. And so uh, we up the number of compute nodes to try and make that a little more realistic than a single provider of a million VMs. <laughs> so um, we, we uh, set the quotas to negative one. We actually ran a number of benchmarks to see if setting the no-op quota driver um, or setting quotas to like 100,000 per tenant uh, would make any difference, and uh, it does not. So we just set uh, quotas to negative one, which means unlimited, and has a few short circuits within the quota DB driver um, for the negative one unlimited thing. But uh, we found that it didn't really make much of a difference whether we set it to 100,000, where it would actually be doing calculations of quotas, um, or negative one, where it's just doing some short circuiting quota calculations. And uh, then we, we, originally <laughs> we originally had PKI set up. Uh, kept running into issues with it. The first issue we ran into was um, the, uh, the Keystone Auth token middleware kept uh, not closing file descriptors, and so we'd have a bunch of zombied defunct processes that are trying to do SSL certifications for the tokens. Uh, then when we tried to do multiple controllers, we ran into uh, more issues with, with PKI. So then I just said, okay, let's just put it on UUID tokens because that's going to stress the database out even more anyway. So um, uh, the, we, we did set the, the token driver uh, or token backend to UUID in, in the Keystone conf, uh, which does generate a, a little more traffic to, um, well, quite a bit more traffic to the Keystone endpoint. Okay, so what we tested, uh, we used Raleigh. So after you install Raleigh, we in the playbook we have Raleigh installation as well. It installs from the Git repository, and you point it to a deployment. Raleigh can actually deploy uh, deploy an OpenStack uh, uh, cluster to you for you as well. It has a pluggable deployment mechanism. So what we actually want to do in the future is to plug in our Ansible playbooks. Uh, which are creating this AWS thing into Raleigh. So we are running a single Raleigh command to create the environment benchmark it, then tear it down. So it... Uh, How many people are familiar with Raleigh, by the way? Raise your hand if you used it. Raise your hand if you're familiar with it. Oh, a few more. Okay. Cool. And, and it's an amazing tool. It's, uh, it's really good. I really like it. I'm, uh, I'm doing... Uh, I'm doing a lot of database benchmarking and, uh, you know, not, not necessarily OpenStack, and I really liked it. So you create a deployment configuration. We created one for, a, for an existing cloud. You can run Raleigh deployment check to, to see if uh, everything is available. And then you can, uh, you can create you know, task descriptions. So, for example, this is the boot and delete server test. You give the flavor, the image name, 
uh, this is the uh, this is the net ID of a shared uh, shared network in uh, in Neutron. Uh, Raleigh right now actually needs this because it creates the users for for the benchmark. So it, it creates its own users and then at cleanup stage it uh, it deletes them. And uh, it, it doesn't yet create uh, it doesn't yet have a facility, although there's a patch in review right now. Um, to create a separate non-shared network for each tenant during the, the pre-deployment phase. So um, that's, that's the reason that we have a shared network for all the tenants. And since we're not really stressing, we're not benchmarking networking itself, we didn't care too much. Uh, I have a feeling that the, the database traffic on the Neutron side um, will be slightly different with non-shared networks um, because the code paths are a little different in how it um, determines which network to uh, to put a put a VM into, um, but uh, for the for the for these benchmarks, we use the shared network. So with that configuration, we run uh, a thousand times with the concurrency of twenty four. So it creates uh, a thousand VMs and then deletes it, and it creates fifty tenants and uh, ten users per per tenant. Okay, and Raleigh. Also, because it's create, it is creating it, its own users, it has the uh, facility to specify different quotas for the rally users. You can just set minus one to them, and you will be able to create as much VMs as you want. This is the command you use to start the rally task, and after it it ended, you can use rally task list to to see, uh, or even if it's not, it, it didn't end yet. And you can use Raleigh Task Report to generate a report. In my report, you will my reports you will see that the Raleigh Task didn't end. There were some issues with, with the cleanup stage, but uh, uh, I talked to Boris yesterday. Uh, by the way, if you are using Raleigh, join OpenStack Raleigh IRC channel. Boris' help help is just amazing, and and the tool is and the tool is. Uh, really good as well. And we'll, sh we'll show you the reports in, in just a bit uh, yeah. that get produced. So, but before sharing the reports, let's talk about Galera and how uh, how does it work a bit. So, you know, uh, based, on, uh, based on what I talk to people, you know, I think this kind of gets you the big picture, but not too much details. I could go on and talk about the details for two days on, so. Uh, the cluster can be seen as a meeting, right? A cluster has a cluster UUID, and I like this meeting analogy. This is from uh, Alexei Yurchenko of Codership. That when somebody leaves the meeting, there is still a meeting going on. So that's one cluster node uh, stopped or failed or something. <coughs> then when he comes back, he joins the meeting again. There is the meeting going on, and there are less and less people, right? Less and less nodes in the meeting. And when the last node leaves, there, are no, uh, there is no cluster UUID anymore. So when a previously failed node or stub node comes back, then it will start a new meeting. And others will join to, to this meeting. This new meeting is the bootstrapping process of extra, extra DB cluster. So if you did service MySQL bootstrap PXE, it's actually the start, uh, start the new meeting thing. So it starts up a new cluster, and the other nodes will, will join to that. OK. I would like to talk a bit about how replication works, especially because of the select for update issue. We, uh, you know, at, the, at the last summit with the, with the database panel discussion, we, we discussed it. Also, I have a blog post on. Uh, percona.com slash blog, which explains uh, this, this select for update issue in depth, like what is exactly causing it, how can you, you know, how can you work it around, why is it there, and stuff like that. But in a nutshell, uh, Galera replicates in write sets. A write set is practically a row-based uh, MySQL binary log event and some metadata. The some metadata is good for two things. Uh, you can uh, compare two write sets and tell if they are conflicting or not. And you can tell if a write set is applicable to the database. So whenever a node, uh, node writes, it goes through a process called certification. 
Certification uh, involves two steps. First is that a write set is compared to every other write set in the, in, in the nodes queue. And because we can write on any node the, in its queue, uh, it can have writes from, you know, from, um, from multiple other nodes. And if, uh, if it doesn't conflict with anything, it checks if it's applicable to the database. What uh, do I think about when I say applicable to the database? For example, if you have an update or, or, or a row image which has a before and an after image as well, then you have to have the key which, which it updates, right? Uh, if you don't have that, uh, that key, then that row-based uh, row event is not applicable to my SQL. Okay, re replication will fail in this case. So after the cert certification is successful on the, on the nodes, it sends it in parallel to all the other nodes in the cluster. So this is the replicate part. And when it gets back, uh, when it gets back from the, uh, the acknowledgement from the other nodes that they received the, the write set, the commit is finalized. The remote nodes will certify uh, the write set similarly, but since uh, GTIDs are assigned uh, based on the group com communication that is established, the certification process is deterministic, so the first node doesn't have to wait for the results of the certification on the remote nodes. Uh, similarly with the, with the full transaction, so this was the auto commit case, single statement transaction. With the full transaction, the case is similar, uh, what is really interesting from this is where the mechanics described here kick in. They kick in at the, at the commit phase. And this is really important because that's the reason why select for update doesn't do what you expect it to do. Because until you commit, the, the record level locks are not, uh, are not replicated across the cluster. They are only locking uh, on the local node. And this is why uh, select for update kind of works when uh, when you only have a single writer node, because then uh, InnoDB's standard uh, pessimistic locking mechanisms will, will kick in. So, so much for Galera. If you, if you want to talk about it, it in more detail, you can come to our booth and, you know, or hit me up anytime if you see me. Okay, so the workload. We did Raleigh boot server and boot and delete server scenarios. The boot server, so with each test, we booted 10k nodes, and then we ran a, a boot and delete with 5k. So we just booted uh, 10,000, left that alone, and then ran a boot and delete for, for 5,000. Uh, boot and delete is a more realistic workload for, uh, for production database iterations because it's a good mix of uh, read and write query, and you know it. it uh, it stresses the database with, with log-heavy queries. So, but we wanted to have something there already. So, okay, all tenants in the Raleigh scenario are used the same shared network. Uh, this is what Jay earlier talked about, and this is the this is the patch which will allow Raleigh to create its own networks. Okay. So for analyzing the MySQL load, we were using PT Query Digest. This is the description of PT Query Digest from our, our website. But uh, PT Query Digest is practically an aggregator for MySQL slow query logs. During the benchmarks, uh, we set long query time to zero, meaning it will log every single slow query. And we turned on per corners enhancements to slow query log. So we have a number of additional metrics in the slow query log with which PT Query Digest uh, can work with. This is a slow query log event. So if you issue this update query, this is what you will get in the, in the slow query log. For example, uh, the InnoDB stuff here is per corner specific, like uh, logging the transaction ID, uh, logging the various InnoDB metrics, and uh, and things like that. And this is an example how to kind of abuse PT Query Digest. It's really just a, just a 
a slow log aggregator, so it's not on it. Uh, it can used for more than just generating the list of queries that consume the most time. Here we are using a filter with with which we can inject actual per code and dumping a single slow log event into uh, in JSON format. So yes, it's it's Perl. Sorry. Yeah, it's Perl. All per on a toolkit is Perl. Okay. So we from the workload we generated the uh, the regular PT query digest, which is just the top queries, but um, because some of you are not using Galera and you know people were running I into issues with Galera, I would like to share that how can you analyze your workload if uh, if it's uh, let's say Galera compliant, right? So. Apart from the top queries, we were generating a digest from the transactions with the most rows affected. Why is this important? If that these are the large transactions, right? If many rows are affected, the transaction is large. If you think about the mechanics we, we talked about, if you hit a large transaction in replication, then it will get certified and it will get into the queue of the node. Right? And Galera has parallel replication because we know that the write sets in the queue are not conflicting because of the certification. What happens if I have a long running transaction in the queue with many other otherwise short transactions? Let's say if I have a queue of 10 transactions, nine of them taking 50 milliseconds, one of them taking two seconds, my replication will be stored for two seconds. Right? So long running transactions can can cause re uh, replication stores. In, uh, in the regular MySQL master slave word, this is manifest. Uh, so these long running transactions, long running writes are, are manifested as slave like typically. So just, just to make it clear, um, mm -hmm. all of these PT query digest commands are applicable for both uh, Galera and standard MySQL master slave replication. It's just um, interpreting the uh, the results of these reports um, is slightly different depending on whether you're using Galera cluster uh, or rather whether you're using standard master-slave replication. But the, the, the commands work identically um, against uh, Galera or standard MySQL. Okay. Another way of getting, uh, getting the large transactions is to examine the transactions with the highest statement count. Uh, I will show an example of that. Uh, we will get the largest statement by uh, by rows affected. The queries that write the most. So we filter out uh, we filter out everything which is not a write in there, and. For the select for update issue, for determining it before going for Galera or before going to multi-node writer, is that uh, we group by the time spent in record lock weights. Because th the record lock weight can potentially, uh, you know, can potentially cause the, cause the select for update and the deadlock issue with, with Galera, because if the so in, in, a sing in case of a single node, if, you, if I update the same record, they will, uh, the second update will wait on, on the first, uh, first transaction's record lock. While in Galera's case, if this happens uh, on two nodes, one of them will win and th the other will have a certification failure. So uh, with this command, you can determine if uh, or or how does select, uh, select for update on multiple writer <coughs> nodes um, affect you? Just one second before we go on. Mm -hmm. um, so what Peter just said about on, uh, if, you, if you have multiple writers going to multiple Galera nodes, right? And uh, two separate writers go get on two separate nodes and they update the same record. For instance, the compute nodes table uh, or a usage record reservations or quotas, that kind of thing, where you have a highly contentious row. It's not like the, the, the nodes are then going to have different representations of the data, which would be data corruption, right? It's just that one, the first one will succeed and the other will issue a certification error. 
And what that manifests is, uh, what, it, what it manifests as is an InnoDB deadlock error, which is why we say it's a deadlock. It's not really a deadlock. Um, it's a certification timeout, but the error code that gets popped up through the various um, SQL Alchemy layers within the OpenStack services is actually an InnoDB deadlock, which is why a lot of people confuse the two things. Right? Okay, so this is the HTML output of Rally, and this is booting uh, 10,000 servers. So the performance was, uh, was really you know, consistent here. This is uh, running it against one uh, database node. If we ran against a multiple one, the performance is, uh, so the average response time is increased a bit more, uh, and we have some errors. Okay. And those errors are? And those errors are timeouts. <laughs> right, mostly. the certification timeouts. With the boot and delete server setup, I try to go fast because we are almost out of time. Uh, with the boot and delete server, uh, writing to to several nodes actually significantly improves performance, despite the fact that we will hit the, the, the hit the deadlocks. So if the application gets a you know an error from MySQL because it, it rolls back the transaction for whatever reason, it should know how to handle that and it should know how to how to retry. So, and some of the code in some of the services does know how to retry it successfully. So there is a decorator within Nova called retry on deadlock, um, <laughs> which does exactly that. It retries when it sees an InnoDB deadlock. Um, sometimes that works just fine. Sometimes uh, it's, it doesn't work so fine. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, the errors that you see in the success here are all related to that InnoDB deadlock, which is manif or the certification timeout, which is manifested as, as an InnoDB deadlock. The important thing to point out here, though, is that we've got 14% mm, or so uh, of the 5,000 uh, total requests to boot and delete a server uh, that are resulting in this. Do you? Do you see this if you run Tempest, for instance, against a production cloud? Yes, Tempest will, because it's run, it's run sequentially and it does boot and delete and reboot and terminate, all that kind of stuff, stop, pause, all in rapid succession, all within the same tenant, you will hit the InnoDB deadlock issue. Do you see it a lot in production? No. I mean, you, you can forcefully produce the deadlock issues, but here, what we're doing is we're just doing database stuff. There's really nothing else going on. It's like just hammering the database. So we're able to reproduce this issue successfully and consistently. But in real production environments with real workloads where you're doing you know, block copies for, for images and snapshots and doing virtual, you know, the, vert, the vert layer itself and spinning up a VM, it's really not something that, I mean, at AT&T, we ran into it, like, I can count on one hand the number of times that it happened in real production workloads. So just make a note of that. So, yeah? Uh, at the end. Thanks. So uh, at the end, we, were, we used the c 3 large instances with 32 cores. The controller node scores were uh, completely saturated, and the database node was using like one and a half, one and a half core. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's how far we, we could load it. So in order to load it, we will need tens of controller nodes. Right, which we plan on doing some more benchmarks and publishing those on our blogs. Um, but the key here is that even in a manufactured benchmark where we're trying to stress the database, uh, we're, we weren't bottlenecked on the database issues at all. We were doing, I don't know, 2,600 transactions a second on the MySQL node, which is nothing. I mean, it, like you say, on a 32-core box, it was using like a core and a half. That's it. Uh, but uh, the Python controller, API services, conductor, 
all those kind of things were maxing out uh, their CPU. So we were hitting CPU issues on the controllers way before, and issues with the message queue as well. Um, and that may have been because of the sort of awful networking in AWS uh, VPC. But um, the point being, the, the database was not the bottleneck. So. OK. Oops, and no some digests. So this is, first I would like to show you that, uh, let's begin with the, with the regular digest output. So this is PT query, di PT query digest output for the first case when we write only to one database and, um, and creating 10K virtual machines. So what you see, saw the fields in the slow log, you see an aggregation here. For example, the total time, the to total walk log time spent in the database is uh, almost a half an hour. You see an aggregation for minimum, maximum, average uh, execution time, 95th percentile, you know, standard deviation and median for each, uh, each slow log event. Also, so all the other things which you saw in the slow log are aggregated like this, including how many InnoDB pages did we hit, how many bytes did we read, how many InnoDB operations did, did we do, and things like that. After that, you find a profile. A profile means that, for example, we have the first query with this fingerprint, which is commit. It takes up most of the, most of the time which is spent in the database. The second query, which has this fingerprint, which, is, uh, which belongs to Neutron, takes 9% of it. Right. And so of all the queries run during the rally payload or benchmark, all of the query payloads out of that, not the commits, but the next one, 9% of all of those queries was to get port bindings <laughs> in Neutron. Of all the queries, 9%. Okay, so let's examine... Uh, and that's the boot server, not the boot and delete. So that's 10,000, just boot, boot 10,000 servers. So this is the query we are talking about for neutron port binding. Delicious, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and what's the, what's the issue with this? So this, is a, this seems to be an easy fix because we see that it's unindexed. And you can check if it's really unindexed that it examines. So you should compare the rows examined and rows sent here it examines uh, ten and a half thousand. Yeah, o on average, let's use average five thousand. Five thousand to return uh, zero point seventy-five. <laughs> so there, yeah, rows. there's there's no index on the queries that are or, uh, they're on the fields that are used in the where or group by condition in that particular monster query, um, and that's the reason why there is a uh, full scan of of the of the table. Okay, so full scans tend to you know, blow up over time. So let's see what happens in the next test where we... Boot and delete. After this, we did boot and delete. The same query takes almost half of the... 50% of the total of the, data, of the, the total same. database time. <laughs> so, so, <the> so it's <laughs> proportional with the, with the amount of data we, uh, we have there. So this will kind of, you know blow up if your database will get larger and larger. But I, I'm not sure who has a database with 15,000 nodes. Who has 15,000 VMs running? Oh, there's lots of, lots of folks. But because they also include deleted instances, right? I yeah. mean, for instance, the, uh, you know, the uh, upstream CI system, any, any given minute is running 500 to 900 nodes that are running OpenStack tests. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean. Uh, there's a lot of deleted instances out there. Um, uh, also note that the second query in the boot and delete is uh, select instance uh, metadata. Uh, that is a table in Nova that contains, it's called instance system metadata. And uh, whenever you boot an instance, we get, uh, we grab a bunch of information from the flavor for the instance type, like, you know, number of CPUs, number of uh, amount of memory used, and we archive that information in the instance system metadata table. So for every instance that you start up, there's between 10 and maybe 45 on average 
uh, n records in that instance system metadata table. So it's an exponentially uh, growing table. And unfortunately, the column types in that table are var card 255 and text or something. Uh, so uh, not exactly the most efficient storage. And uh, it blows up significantly very quickly. Um, and as you can see, the 13% the t the or so of all of the queries executed uh, are on that table. So for this, you see full join as well, but it's uh, kind of misleading because it's a full join because it has this. So this is the whole query. Again, juicy. Because it has a table subquery, so I'm highlighting the part from select. W and this select returns only only one record. So this is uh, this query's result will be will generate a TMP table, the N on one TMP table, and you know it will be a full join against it, but it's a table with a with a single row. And right. how can you tell it otherwise? Again, you can examine the rows examined and the rows sent. So on, ev on le let's use the maximum here, but the average is pretty close. Just the maximum have you know wrong numbers. So it examines 15 rows to return uh, return 16. This is not that bad. This means that uh, you cannot help this this much with indexing. So it's uh, it's what you are, you talked about that it's it's the structure what. It's the it, scheme it, itself. It means, it means that it's the structure which we, which we can help, it, help it with. OK, so l let's examine uh, something else. Um, let's do. I think, yeah, we're le let's think we're getting close to time as well, just to let you know. OK. So I'm probably just rambling too much. Um, the, the other thing okay. that we probably want to point out is the rollbacks. Yeah. So let's go on the rollbacks. So, the, so let's examine the record lock weights, right? So here we group group by uh, uh, spending time in uh, waiting for InnoDB rec record locks. So if you check, here is record lock weight. We spent a total of uh, 45 seconds here uh, during the test waiting on the record locks. But uh, the maximum of is like 300 milliseconds, right? And it's uh, it's this query. So this report with group by the record lock weights. Yeah, note the for update. <laughs> and l l let's check the second query. Oh, for look update. what's there. Let's check the third one. Okay, this is an insert, probably waiting on a select for update. Well, it's an insert into the reservations table, which is highly contentious because there are updates and inserts going on and deletes at the same time. So most of the record lock weights here are, are coming from these uh, these select for updates. So this way, you can, you know, with this report generated, you can determine how much uh, how much conflicting write sets uh, will affect you when moving to Galera. Final one. Let's put on the digest transaction most statements. Go down. Yes, yeah, so here we have, we are grouping here by InnoDB transaction ID. So this is not a query, this is an InnoDB transaction. And let, let's check what is, the, what is the top thing here, right? What uh, a, transac a transaction with, with 1,000 queries. You can grab in the slow log like this to get all the events belonging to a transaction. And if you grab out commits and sets, you will see the actual uh, SQL of the given transaction. And you can see that I forgot to reset the slow log after deploying the cluster. <laughs> That's the issue here, right? So the, the next, uh, the next um, transaction with the most rows affected affects only 30. So we don't have particularly large transactions only right. at, at the time of initialization. So I think we, we need to wrap this up because yes. there's another session coming up. Um, so thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. And uh, please, please come and talk to both of us. We can talk about this all day long. Thanks. <laughs>